Good morning, everyone. I'm my own technician this morning, so I want to make sure that, that I'm coming through somewhere out there. So let me just check here. All right, we do have an image of me sitting here looking at the computer. <laughs> Perfect. Well, this morning, everything. What is up with everything? I thought was a fun topic. And uh, so we're going to find out exactly, well, maybe, what is up with everything? I'm going to start with a Hafiz poem this morning on page 256 from my book. Hafiz titled this poem, It Has Not Rained Light. It has not rained light for many days. The wells in most eyes look drought-stricken. Thus, friends are not easy to find in this barren place where most everyone has become ill from guarding nothing. On this primal caravan, careers and cities can appear real in this intense desert heat. But I say to my close ones, don't get lost in them. It has not rained light here for days. Look, most everyone is diseased from making love to nothing. That's speaking to that idea of, of seeing the world, the material, as real and being drawn into it somehow with all of its concerns. In the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Vijay and the Master are sitting and having a conversation what must the bound soul's condition of mind be in order to achieve liberation? What does the condition of our mind have to be to be free, he's asking. And the master says, he can free himself from attachment to lust and greed if, by the grace of God, he cultivates a spirit of strong renunciation. What is this strong renunciation? One who has only a mild spirit of renunciation says, well, all will happen in the course of time. Let me now simply repeat the name of God. But a man possessed of a strong spirit of renunciation feels restless for God, as the mother feels for her own child. A man of strong renunciation seeks nothing, nothing for but me. God. For me. Um, I found out. Jerry, we're live online. Can I talk to you? No. Please? No. It's important. No, I'm online right now giving a lecture. Oh, can I sit in here with you? No. Go. Okay. Go I ahead. need to talk to someone. Well, how are you doing? I'm how sorry. <laughs> how are you? We are close now. Over there. Over there in the lecture, yeah. Is this the class queen? Washington DC lecture. Oh, but I need to uh, because my Sunday before Sunday lecture, I need to make the faces and leaves the shine. That's fine. Is that just, okay? Yeah, just don't be don't Because be loud. the shine you don't see. I know, I don't yeah. mind for that yeah. time. I hope. Well, there you go. We have a first. We've got the homeless wandering into the temple, <laughs> taking care of things. My apology for that. He's been around for a while, actually, one of our regulars. <laughs> so, doesn't take no for an answer. All right, so we're talking about Vijay and, and Sri Ramakrishna, and Vijay wanting to know what is the condition of mind for a person to be free, to find freedom, to have his his emancipation from this, this whirling cycle of, of activity and interest. 
The master says he can free himself from attachment to woman and gold if, by the grace of God, he cultivates a spirit of strong renunciation. So there's two things there very important. Number one, it's by the grace of the divine. To draw near to God, it's not a matter in change in behavior for yourself. It's a matter in change of accepting the divine love of God, of trusting that love that's unconditioned, giving yourself an inner and very deep permission to open to the presence of God and to be willing to live in the presence of God without any defenses, without any need to distract your mind for comfort, resigning your fear of the divine at the feet of God, resigning your doubt in yourself, resigning your belief in weakness at the feet of the divine, and moving forward in that and cultivating, he says, this intense renunciation. So this, this renunciation based on a knowledge of, of the nature of this world, to know that everything that we have and experience is going, disappearing, on its way out, nothing will last, nothing can be held onto, nothing accumulates over time. It all evaporates. And to know this and to develop this renunciation, a renunciation to simply let it go and not to watch it leave, but a renunciation that's momentary in its, in, in its effort, simply a, a denial by mind, no, we are not going that direction, but while the eyes are on the beloved, while the eyes are on that inner spirit, that inner teacher that makes itself apparent when the mind begins to quiet. By the grace of God, this happens. It's not a worry of how will I do this? How can I do this? The very first thing the master says here to Vijay is that it's by the grace of God. So draw near to that inner well of love in you. Draw near to that inner inspiration Find it, look at things that you love and abstract yourself away from them and turn your eyes to where the love is coming from within you. You will see very clearly that it's not things outside of you that are bringing this love to you, that it's not the world outside that's bringing enjoyment to you. You come to realize that this enjoyment is welling up from within you and things outside seem to be just an opportunity, an effervescent mirror that for a moment sparkles and reminds you of something deep and profound within yourself. All the love that you feel for the people in your life comes from within you. If it came from those people, everyone would feel them in their presence. But because it's not from the objects and people outside of us, it's from within. Knowing this and knowing the nature of the world, we renounce. We put our eyes inward on that divine spirit, this existence within, this love within, this intelligence within that is constantly teaching us and constantly giving meaning and purpose to all the things of the world and the senses, a strong renunciation not a mild renunciation, not a renunciation that's like, oh, in time, we'll get there. Oh, you know, yeah, we'll get around to that. What is that? What kind of love is that? Are we that casual in our deepest relationships? Do we just keep people at the edge of our mind? No, this is a call to a depth, to a commitment, to a divine intoxication. A mild spirit of renunciation says, well, it's going to happen in the course of time. Let me just now simply repeat the name of God, have a cup of coffee, make myself comfortable, put on my favorite chutter, have my moment of relaxation, which I'll get up and walk away from when it's over. No, a man possessed of strong renunciation feels restless for God as a mother feels for her own child. A man of strong renunciation seeks nothing but God. He regards the world as de a deep well and feels as if he were going to be drowned in it. He looks on his relatives as venomous snakes. He wants to fly away from them, and he does go away. He never thinks, let me first make some arrangement for family, and then I shall think of God. He has great inward resolution. So, of course, the master here is painting a very intense picture. And the point isn't how the family's treated. The point isn't how he is or isn't making uh, provisions for the people in his life. The point is his mind is on God. His mind is on love. 
This word God gets so misused, so confused in so many minds these days. Let's go to love, go to intelligence, go to existence. This is where the mind dwells. It dwells in a great state of sobriety, seeing all the objects of the senses with an objectivity and a clarity, not being pulled in to the possibilities, the seeming possibilities, because they never deliver. And what they do deliver cannot last and simply leaves an impression or a hunger for more within. And so once again, you get caught in that loop. But a great inward resolution is necessary. This strength of mind that your no is your no and your yes is your yes. He goes on. He wants to tell us a story. I want to tell you a story about strong renunciation. At one time, there was a drought in a certain part of the country. <laughs> Something we can identify with here in the Southwest for sure. The farmers began to cut long channels to bring water to their fields. One farmer was stubbornly determined. That's another word for your strong renunciation. Stubbornly determined. He took a vow that he would not stop digging until a channel connected his field with the river. He set to work. Went about the effort. And it wasn't just an effort for an hour in the morning before the day started and an effort at an hour at the end of the day. He saw this as his life's purpose, as his focus. This was what was necessary and everything for the entire day goes into it. The time came for his bath and his wife sent their daughter to him with oil. Father, said the girl, it's already late. Rub your body with oil and take your bath. Go away, thundered the farmer. I have too much to do now. It was past midday and the farmer was still at work in his field. He didn't even think of his bath. This is the key to, a, to maintaining a strong renunciation, is this notion of not even thinking about the alternatives. When your vices rise up in the mind, you don't even think of them, not even long enough to deny them. Simply no. And the focus is back on divine love, back on divine presence, back on the task at hand, which is to purify and quiet the mind so that with that which is apparent, that which is obvious, can become apparent to us, that we can see clearly. He didn't even think of his bath. Then his wife came and said, why haven't you taken your bath? The food, it's getting cold. You overdo everything. Isn't this exactly how the world will treat you in the face of this renunciation? What is this? You're over such an extremist. Why, what's, chill out, relax a little bit, enjoy yourself. All of your friends will say that. All of your family will say that. But this determination, this fire in the farmer yelling at his daughter, what it, have you no mind? <laughs> Doesn't even think of his bath. The farmer scolded his wife furiously and ran at her, spade in hand, crying, what? Have you no sense? There's no rain. The crops are dying. What will the children eat? You'll all starve to death. I have taken a vow not to think of bath and food today before I bring water to my field. The wife saw his state of mind and ran away in fear through a whole day's back-breaking labor. Indeed, how many of us can describe our sadhana that way? <laughs> back-breaking labor, that intensity of application when faced with this. You know, these, these things, these ideas of God, of 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 enlightenment and, and pure love and ecstasy and all of these things that we see in the saints and the sages and the, and the stories that they tell, the accounts that they share of, of the bliss and wonder of this experience and of this infinite shattering depth to the experience of life, to this profundity that we sit in, in commonality with all the time and forget about get lulled into this sleep of acceptance. Everything is normal and ordinary. Everything's within the bounds of acceptable. Wake up, the sages say, wake up. With this intense knowledge, dissect this world, break the illusion, 
go through the promises to the actual nature of what is and find it divine. Find it all to be within yourself. Find your freedom, a need for nothing, not a desire of the body, not a desire of the mind to constantly hound you and drive you into pointless things. This disease of making love to nothing that Hafiz was talking about in that poem. He scolded his wife furiously, ran at her with a spade in hand, crying, what have you no sense? That's how he counters the whole world when the world is turning on him and saying, what is this intensity? What is this fanaticism? What's going on with you? Well, just chill out, just live your life. In anger, he scolds, no, have you no sense? Do you not understand? Do you not see the days disappearing from you? moment by moment passing away. Does not your aging face in the mirror every morning give you the message, all of this is going, all that you're throwing your effort to in this world, all that you're nurturing and loving and chasing in this world will expire. And what do you have? What do you know that will last beyond that? Where will you stand as you watch it slip away one day? Where will you stand? Then he, the wife saw his state of mind and ran away in fear. Through a day's back-breaking labor, the farmer managed by evening to connect, to connect his field with the river. So he manages. It wasn't a vain effort. He actually succeeded, connects his field, drought-stricken field, to the river. Then... Then he sat down and watched the water flowing into his field with a murmuring sound. His mind was filled with peace and joy. He went home, called his wife and said to her, now let's have that oil, let's have that smoke. And with a serene mind, he finished his bath and his meal and retired to bed where he snored to his heart's content. The determination he showed this is an example of strong renunciation, Ramakrishna says to us this morning. You put your effort in, the fruit will be born. That knowledge of God will become apparent. The presence of the divine in all things will give you that peace and that restore that inner strength. And in that, you can then take your repose and sit with the beloved. Sit there and have your smoke and have your meal in the presence of God. Now there was another farmer, Ramakrishna says, who was also digging a channel to bring water to his field. His wife, too, came to the field and said to him, It's very late. Come home. It isn't necessary to overdo things like this. The farmer didn't protest too much. He put aside his spade and said to his wife, Well, I'll go just because you asked me to. That man never succeeded in irrigating his field. This is a case of mild renunciation. So this renunciation comes, uh, it comes through knowledge. You know, so often, especially in religious life, we start not doing things because we're told that they're wrong. You know, there's a list of things that are immoral. Oh, don't do those things. God's not happy with those things. And we, we put the entire conversation outside of ourself in this imaginary state, but we don't address the real issue. The real issue is not whether things are right and wrong. The real issue is why is this the desire for things in you when they re don't return anything lasting? when they don't give you anything to stand on or build on, when they enslave you to a constant cycle of needing more, a constant hunger and a constant thirst. So it's not that we renounce things because they're wrong in some architectured dogma sort of way. It's that we have looked with a sobriety and a clarity at the nature of the world and its things. We've made a sound decision in a deep understanding and we let go in the quest to find that one thing which lasts, that one thing that fulfills, that one thing that heals and fixes and raises up and encourages. We look for that one thing and it being more valuable than all of the deteriorating, disappearing things of the world stands alone 
and intense renunciation. As without strong determination the farmer cannot bring water to his field, so also without intense yearning a man cannot realize God. Ramakrishna really laying out the situation here, the intensity that's necessary to do the work at hand. We all speak of enlightenment. We all speak of wanting to be great people, loving people, forgiving people. We all want that beautiful obituary when we pass away. And yet, do we live as if it's the one most important thing? We enjoy love, but do we live for love? We enjoy the divine in the world around us through all of the tastes, the flavors, the sounds, the smells, the sights. But do we live for the divine within it all? Do we see the unity and the harmony in it? Are we willing to give up this individuation, this particularity of a body and a mind that chooses and picks what to exclude, what to include? gives its embrace selectively to a small number of people in the world when such a large number of people in the world need it. Forgiveness is tapasya. Holy Mother says, I too had to purify myself for coming into contact with filth on several occasions, but I only chanted the name of Govinda a few times and felt pure. The mind is everything. It is in the mind alone that one feels pure and impure. A man, first of all, must make his own mind guilty, and then alone can he see another man's guilt. Does anything ever happen to another if you enumerate his faults? It only injures you. This has been my attitude from childhood. Hence, I can't see anybody's faults. If a man does a trifle for me, I try to remember him even for that. To see the faults of others, one should never do it. I never do so. Forgiveness is tapasya. So the mother is here bringing it even one step deeper. You know, the title of this is What's Up With Everything? And mother says here, the mind is everything. This is something we're going to touch on quite a bit because it's fundamental to living in a healthy way in this world. And it's once again to understand everything is mind. You live in a mind. There is no world out there, no verifiable world out there. Of course, the master says there's something there, like there's the white screen behind the movie. It's the movie that's unreal, not the white screen or the light that's shining and creating it. But the story is made up by you. The movement and change of the movie is made up by you. It happens in the mind alone. It doesn't happen on the screen in front of you. The mind is compiled in your mind. The movie is compiled in your mind. Put together, you associate the soundtrack with the still images. You see the changing images and you, you put in the, the parts in between frames that make movement. You identify with the movie. And by identifying with the movie, you give it your emotions, you give it your story, you give it its meaning, you give it its sense of cause and effect. And that movie comes alive for you. You see this, this world. Can you not see this is the same thing? You are the one that makes this life meaningful. You are the one that's created your troubles and created your anxieties and created your weaknesses and created your shortcomings. You are the one who are tell is telling yourself the story about why enlightenment is difficult and how your vices are so powerful and how your weaknesses are, are just unmanageable and, and can't be overcome. It is your story and your identity with that story makes it true. You suffer at your own hand. It is all mind. You must make these problems in your own mind before you can see them in the world around you. A disciple says, well, Swami Vivekananda used to say, suppose a thief entered the house and stole something. The idea of a thief would flash in your mind, but a baby has no such idea. Therefore, it would not see anyone as a, thie as a thief. Mother, that's true indeed. He who has a pure mind sees everything pure. Now, 
if you stand in a congregation of worldly folks and say something like this, there are so many holes in it from there shooting it down saying, oh, that's ridiculous. What, you're telling me thieves don't exist? Are you telling me these things out there don't mean anything? Are you telling me that the problems in my life aren't caused by other people? Yes, exactly. That's what we're talking about. If that's unbelievable to you, then just simply do some more contemplation and work it out in your mind. Become pure enough. And what does this purity mean? It's that separation of the sense of self from body and mind. Because yes, it's true that there are troubles in the mind and these seem to source themselves in things outside of ourselves. Yes, there's troubles in the body and it seems to come from outside of ourself. That's because you are not the body. The body is an idea of mind and you are not the mind. It is its own idea. You are that ever free witness, that ever pure self. And separating yourself out from the body and mind will release you from so many of their desires and hungers and thirsts and give you so much deeper a clarity into the nature of love and the nature of life and begin to awaken suspicions of immortality and infinity, of a divine love so intoxicating, so beautiful, that despite the best efforts of mankind, religion has endured for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and will endure again forever. Because of its greatness? No, because of its truth. Because of this higher nature that exists within us that can take a meaningless world of material and fashion a beautiful story of love and drama, of learning and growth, of freedom, ending in a unity with all things, in a knowledge so profound and so comforting. Sri Ramakrishna goes on in the gospel. He says, it is all a question of the mind. Do you see where this is coming? It's coming right into the heart of you. It is all a question of the mind. Bondage and liberation are of the mind alone. The mind will take the color that you dye it with. It is like white clothes just returned from the laundry. If you dip them in red dye, they will be red. If you dip them in blue or green, they will be blue or green. They will take only the color that you dip them in, whatever it may be. How careful should we be with our mind? This mind that we live in, this mind that we were born into, this perspective of the world that we treasure and carry, this personality of wit and love that we've manufactured and identified ourselves as being. It's your mind. It's your story. You cling to it. You tell it, you hold on to it, but it's only a story. Be careful about the things that you put in your mind, the things that you eat, they're offerings, direct offerings to God. Everything that you allow into your body enters the temple. This is the temple. How careful you are about not wearing shoes in the temple that you go to on Sundays. But how careful are you of the purity of the temple you carry with you all the time? You're very busy washing your hands with, with, with Ganga water in order to go in and offer a flower to the divine. How careful are you to wash those same hands when you eat and when you look at something in the world or you read something in the newspaper or you listen to something on the TV or the radio or on the bus? Are you as careful about your purity at those times as you are when you're walking into what is just a building? You are the temple that gives every temple holiness. You are the shrine through which the divine manifests in this world most purely. You are the highest ideal of God at the moment. Be careful of the mind. It takes the color that you dye it with. Haven't you noticed, Ramakrishna says, that if you read a little English, you at once begin to utter English words. Foot, foot, what bit? <laughs> the master mimicking the sound of English. Then you put on boots and you whistle a tune and so on. It all goes together. 
Or if a scholar studies Sanskrit, will he not at once rattle off Sanskrit verses? If you are in bad company, well, then will you not talk and think like your companions? On the other hand, when you are in the company of devotees, you will think and talk only of God. This wonderful clue here, this condition of the mind that you're in, it produces the actions. Your offering to God is produced by what you offer on the shrine of your heart through the senses of the body and the thoughts of the mind. All of them are going on the shrine of your heart. Are you as careful in their selection as you are when you're trying to pick the perfect flower to give to the Divine Mother on the altar? Are you as careful in the preparation of your thoughts as you are in the preparation of your food that you're going to offer on the shrine? The special dishes, the special mantras, the special cleaning. It's all one. It isn't separate. The way that you live and your spiritual life are not separate. The purity of your activities and, and, and daily mindset is no different from your moment in the temple because you live in a temple. You live in this body with its shrine in the heart where God manifests as divine love in this world. And it's the mistakes that you've put into your mind, the shortcomings that you've put into your mind that has taken this infinite love that is coming at a constant flow in an infinite bottomless way through your heart and you've managed to constrict it into something so small, so particular, that serves only the purposes and desires of a body and a sick mind. Be careful about the condition of your mind be careful about what you put into it, what you think about in it, for all of it is laid freely and openly at the feet of your beloved. They are your offering to God, and they will result in your actions, your doings in this world. Are the doings of your life vain? Are they meaningless because they're for things that always go away? Are you building your house on sand, on the changing nature of the world, which will never stand? What a great lesson in building a sand castle. It will wash away. Everything you've built in this world, everything you've invested in, every dollar you've collected, every family member you've reared will pass away. It will flatten out like the beach at high tide. What will you be left with? What have you placed within the mind within which you live? Have you learned to worship at the temple that you live in? Have you even recognized it? Have you plumbed the depths of its peace and its harmony? Have you looked within to find a love so authentic so true that it would be the perfect gift for everyone that you pass. The mind is everything, he says it. So we've heard that from Vivekananda, we've heard that from Holy Mother, now we're hearing it from Ramakrishna. The mind is everything. A man has his wife on one side, his daughter on the other, he shows his affections to them in different ways, but his mind is one and the same. You see, he's giving us a clue of practice here. The mind does and thinks many things. It produces a diversity of responsibility, a diversity of tradition, a diversity of everything. But that diversity is happening within a singularity that diversity is happening within the unity of the mind. The mind is always one, always the same. The master goes on, bondage is of the mind, freedom, it is also of the mind. A man is free if he constantly thinks, I am a free soul. How can I be bound? Whether I live in the world or in the forest, I'm a child of God, the King of Kings. Who can bind me? 
In the same way, by repeating with grit and determination, I am not bound, I am free, one really becomes so. One really becomes free. And what is this freedom? Is it the, the, the freedom of this world where you're just free to do what you want to do? You see, that only seems like freedom when you're attached to body and mind, when you identify with the body and mind, when you identify with things as being you that are passing away, that are slipping away constantly in time. When you say that, that I am this, and you come up with a definition of yourself, you can know for sure that that has not always been you. You say, I'm a man. You weren't a man when you were two. You can say, I'm an engineer. You weren't an engineer when you were 12. You can say that I'm a husband. You can say anything you want your, about yourself. And if it's based on changing things, it is not true. You are bound. You are deluded. You are without understanding. A firm renunciation is your medicine. A stubborn application of yourself to an effort of understanding, turning within, sorting through the mind with a sober spirit, dwelling presently in the moment and seeing things clearly as they are and not as the accumulated stories define them to be. A man who constantly thinks, I am free, free from desire. Freedom means nothing is necessary. Freedom means there is no compulsion to do, to act, to be, to say. Freedom is being full and sated and being able to sit on your porch in the afternoon and see the world as perfect, to understand that it is as it should be. And that only comes when the love that you have to give is flowing freely. When your relationship with God transcends fear, transcends obligation, and turns into inspiration and manifestation. By repeating with grit and determination, I am not bound, I am free. That is renunciation. To say that I am not bound, I am not under compulsion. I don't have to do anything that my body or mind tells me to do. I am free. I do not have a desire to push me out of my peace. Eckhart Tolle says in The Power of Now, what is the greatest obstacle to experiencing this reality? What is it? It's the same question that Vijay asks. What is this that's causing all of this trouble? What are the obstacles to being free? He says, identification with your mind. That's when you attach your eye to a thought. That's when you attach your eye to, a, to an adjective, to a description about what you are. It's when the body becomes thirsty and you make the mistake of saying, I'm thirsty. When the mind becomes angry and you make the mistake of saying, I'm angry. Because you've identified with them and through that identity with them, you are compelled to act accordingly. But if you learn to understand and see clearly that you are not angry, the mind is angry. You are that ever free love, that ever beautiful bliss, that intelligence. You are the profundity of existence. If you act from that place, you're free. You're acting through inspiration, through nature, through authenticity. If you act through mind, identifying with its constant change of, and bouquet of moods and flavors and understandings, then you're clouded, you're unstable, you're a hypocrite and inauthentic. You have not yet learned to be a human being. Identification with your mind is the greatest obstacle to experiencing the reality. It causes thought to become compulsive 
Not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction. But we don't realize this because almost everybody is suffering from it, so it's considered normal. This incessant mental noise prevents you from finding that realm of inner stillness that is inseparable from being. It also creates a false mind-made self that casts a shadow of fear and suffering. You see, everything is mind. Everything is mind. Bring that into this moment. Stop your stories. Don't think about yesterday to come up with a definition for it. Don't think about tomorrow to think about how it is. Come into this moment and look at the condition of your mind. Are you troubled? Are you anxious? Are you happy? Are you content? Are you free? Or are you convinced that there's a story that bears your name, that has to be dealt with, that has to be taken care of. All of your troubles are in this moment. If you can find a moment, a way of being at peace with the mind here and now, that's the treasure indeed. That peace lies in the name of the beloved, the thought of God which little by little by little will take over your entire sense of self and you'll identify not with a petty mind but with a stable, unconditioned love. You'll identify not with a hungry, needy body but with a confident, established self, ever free and ever pure. In volume three of Swami Vivekananda's life by his Eastern and Western disciples, it says, with what pride Vivekananda would remind the listener that according to Hindu savants, the whole universe is only the meaning of words. After the word comes the thing. Therefore, the idea is all. Wow, there's a meditation right there. <laughs> there's something to think profoundly about for a while. You are the world that you live in. You've created it in real time in this moment by holding on to the story of your life right now. But if you take that stubborn determination, I am not this story. I'm ever free. I am not bound to do the necessary thing next. I am free. This moment is my freedom. I have nothing to do but this manifestation of divine love. And all will be well. The mind will take care of the things mind needs to take care of. The body will take care of the things body needs to take care of. You are the eternal free witness, watching the play of divine love. If you see it from the center of soul, it's perfect. If you see it by identifying with a body, there's misery, multiple things wrong. If you see it through an ever-changing and unstable mind, there's anxiety and fear. But find the soul, find the eternal self within, that which has never changed through your experience of an aging and growing body that which has never changed despite the turmoil of moods and frustrations of a mind. Touch that self and let it take you into the temple of, of you. Touch that self and sit in meditation in your own shrine, the shrine you were born into and the shrine you will enter into when the body falls. This world is an idea. You are in charge. Be the change that you want to see, in the words of If a man repeats the name of God, his body, mind, and everything becomes pure. You want to wonder how to solve your problems? Put your mind on its highest ideal. Again, when we talk of God, we're not talking of a third party imagined being somewhere, someplace, doing something. 
in some way with some will. We're talking about the isness of being. We're talking about a divine love, that which is both formless and without and with form, that which has become everything that your senses pick up, that which is the white screen behind the movie of your mind, that which is the unchanging source of light that is the expression of everything you do. If a man repeats the name of God, the divine, his body, his mind, everything becomes pure. Why should one talk only about sin and hell and such things? Say but once, O Lord, I have undoubtedly done wicked things. I won't repeat them. This is that stern renunciation. I won't repeat them, not so much because they're wrong, but because I see the fruit of them to be empty and meaningless. I see that the effort that they constantly engage me in in trying to collect or gather or get is vain and leaves me hungry, leaves me tired, leaves me bitter, leaves me alone, leaves me confused and unfulfilled because you have not plumbed the nature of your own existence. You have not plunged the authenticity of being, of what it is to be human. Say but once, O Lord, I have undoubtedly done wicked things, but I won't repeat them. My yes is yes and my no is no and have faith in his name. What is this faith, this faith, this understanding, this intuitive knowledge of a divine relationship that gives us the idea of an ideal, of a perfection? Something new that I've added to my list of what we have, what we bring into this world with us that this world cannot teach us about. You know, my usual ones are immortality. Where did we learn that? That's an easy one. We brought it with us because there's nothing here that could even have given us that concept. The idea of infinity, again, something we cannot find here. But even more than those two now to me is this notion of an ideal, a perfection. How do we know this perfection? Why do we strive for a perfection that in this world is impossible. There is nothing perfect here. How do we know of perfection unless it exists as part and parcel of our divine self, this being which will never rest until that unity is manifested, until unconditioned love is the only story told until intelligence lies behind everything done. The thing is but a feeble manifestation of the pre-existing and eternal idea. The thing is the everything. Everything you've counted as separate from yourself exists just as an idea. Have you looked close enough to see that? Everything is just a thought. You've attributed them to, 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 to an external world. You've attributed them to, to, to elements and to things that you can't verify. They're only a sequence of thoughts. Your life is a movie that you're watching in your own mind. It's ephemeral. Its nature is unreal. You know that you suspect that deep down inside. You know that you can see that. When for a moment you're quiet and think about this self that has always been there. The self that's not different, even though the body's different. The self that's not different, even though the mind is different. All of these things that you observe, by definition, cannot be what you are. You are transcendent to them. 
You're the observer of them. Your own name, Vivekananda says, is infinitely more perfect than the person you. The name of God is greater than God. Guard your speech. Why? Because your speech is your offering. Your speech is the witness of what you've consumed, what you've placed on the shrine of the heart. Religion is not a creed, but an experience, and experiences only happen here and now. Creeds are the story. Dogmas are the story. Practices are the story. But God is the experience of the moment, not the experience of your story about this moment, but God is the experience of the moment. God is this. God is. Religion is not a creed, but an experience, a process of being and becoming. If it be true that this process leads inevitably from the apprehension of the manifold to the realization of the one, then it must also be true that everything is in the mind and that the material is nothing more than the concretizing of ideas. It's a hard thing to swallow. Which came first, a tree or the idea of a tree? In our delusion, we think the tree comes first and we get the idea of the tree. Because the apparent world seems that way. This temple that I'm sitting in, it seems like, oh, the temple was here and now I have the idea of the temple. No. There was a time when this temple wasn't here and it was an idea that gave birth to this temple. It's a very important thing to understand. This world is manifested newly at every moment in your mind. Learn to know that you are dreaming by insisting on your freedom. Everything exists already in the self of all beings, Vivekananda says. He who asserts he is free shall be free. He who says he is bound, bound he shall remain. Be careful about your words. Be careful about your mind, because you have to live them. If in your mind you hold on to the story that realization is impossible, oh, I'm so impure, I have so many things to do, it's going to be lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes before I have my realization. I'm weak and I'm tired and I can't get up and I can't do my practice and I hate to meditate and I hate to study and I hate to read and I don't feel like being good, I feel like being lazy. Be careful of your words. You will have to live them. They are your story. Your attachment to them makes them your karma. You cannot escape them. You have to change them. I am ever free. I am ever pure. My yes is yes and my no is no. I will give my entire effort to getting water into my field today. And my enjoyment of life will be the enjoyment of seeing its truth. My enjoyment of life will be to sit in the midst of that infinite love and watch it pour out from this and find inspiration, the meaning and the point of being. Here and now, a mind that luxuriates in the grace of the divine, a mind that finds its freedom in the forgiveness and mercy of a beloved of infinite ways. A mind who doesn't need to do and express, but has resigned itself in pure surrender to simply manifest that which is, an understanding of love, a knowledge of truth, a strength of immortality, the fearlessness of infinity.
There's a beautiful example of this in a Christian saint named Brother Lawrence, who many of you have heard of from me before, or maybe from others. He writes this in his reminiscences and his letters about himself. As for what passes in me at present, I can't express it. I have no pain or difficulty about my state because I have no will but that of God. Let that soak in for a moment. I have no will but that of God. And let us again change the word God to love, to Satchitananda. I have no will but that of love. I have no will but that of pure intelligence. Which I endeavor to accomplish in all things. That is our stubborn application. That is our intense renunciation. That I endeavor to accomplish in all things and to which I am so resigned that I would not take up a straw from the ground against his order or from any other motive than purely that of love to God. Love to love. Love for its own sake. Love because it is beauty. It is inspiration. It is the song in everything. I have quit all forms of devotion, Brother Lawrence says, and set prayers, but those to which my state obliged me, and I make it my business only to persevere in his holy presence, wherein I keep myself by a simple attention and a general fond regard to God, which I may call an actual presence of God, or to speak better, the habitual, silent, and secret conversation of the soul with God, which often causes me joys and raptures inwardly and sometimes also outwardly so great that I am forced to use means to moderate them and to prevent their appearance to others. So you see, he has mastered finding the moment, finding God, finding pure love, bliss in this moment. And it has given him an experience of the here and now that is so full of bliss, so full of inspiration, so full of love, that he has to come up with ways of hiding it from the world because it's so overpowering, because the giggling wants to fill the room, the laughter wants to drown out the noise. He goes on, the king, my beloved God, full of mercy and goodness, very far from chastising me, embraces me with love, makes me eat at his table, serves me with his own hands, gives me the key of his treasures. He converses and delights himself with me incessantly in a thousand and a thousand ways and treats me in all respects as his favorite. It is that I consider myself from time to time in his holy presence. This is a pure life. This is an authentic human being who has found his nature, who understands himself to be a manifestation of this God, this divinity, a man who has understood that this God exists deep within his own self and that his life is only the impression of that existence, the manifestation of that being the story of that intelligence and the depth of that love. The history of the world, Vivekananda says, is a history of a few men who had faith in themselves, not in themselves as a body, not in themselves as a mind, but in themselves as a manifestation of the beloved, of the divine principle from whom the golden rule is born. From whom the purity of love for its own sake is born. That faith calls out the divinity within, 
You can do anything. Add that to your story now. Do not let your story be about weakness. There is no such thing. Do not let your story be about selfishness. There is no such thing. Do not let your story be about mind and body. That faith calls out this divinity within. You can do anything. You fail only when you do not strive sufficiently to manifest infinite power. As soon as a man or a nation loses faith, death has come. Be infinitely faithful. You can do anything. You are ever free, ever pure, ever blissful. Manifest that. Come to the present moment. Worship in the shrine of your body and mind. Find the divinity within and in that sincerity of being, in that sincerity of truth. Know you are free. You are blissful. You are immortal. You are one. This is what's up with everything.